All right, so um, tell us a bit about um, growing up in Northampton then, Leslie. What okay, were your growing up in defining North moments of your childhood? Growing up in Northampton. Um, growing up in Northampton was extraordinary because we were the last house in the town. I mean, I was born in 1945, so the house I grew up in was at the end of, the, of a little lane. and The lane had no tarmac on it. It was literally a lane where pigs and cows and sheep would come down. And opposite was a farm and a deep well. And it was the most idyllic country. I mean, it was idyllic countryside. Last house in the town. Wonderful, wonderful childhood. We were wild. We used to, I mean, literally, I, so after the war, it was all ration books and digging to Australia in the garden and, and you know, getting to know everybody. And I remember watching the coronation on um, the television in 19. 1953 and literally we were the only person in the street with a, with a television and they used to queue up and say can I watch television so we used to have about 20 kids in in every day watching television in our house and I've still got the television um it was a 12 inch bush I remember Christopher Biggins and I got hysterical over that at one point but um, <laughs> that's what it was and I've still got it and it's one of my prized possessions and it, yeah, it was an extraordinary childhood, really. And so, do you do you sort of recall when you first got a taste for performing and acting and theatre? Well, I mean, it to be honest, like sort of... to be honest, I I remember wanting to act since I was four, and I first went on a stage at the New Theatre in Northampton, which is knocked down now in Abington Street in Northampton, um, and I sang a song from. Um, Hansel and Gretel, with my feet I tap, 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 with my hands I clap, tap, clap, right foot first, left foot, then round about and back again. Why I sang that song, I've not a clue, but I was seven. And, um, and then uh, I used to go and see pantomime um, at the Royal Theatre in Northampton, which is a stunning theatre. I mean, it's an old, beautiful, really lovely Victorian, tiny, but just beautiful I'm, I'm assuming it's a matron theatre I don't know it's absolutely gorgeous and I used to go and sit and watch that and so I obviously um, um throughout my school days I had elocution classes and a, a lady called Miss Edgecombe and I used to come up to London and take part in um, poetry speaking competitions and I remember I won a, a cup once for saying the poem Felix Randall the farrier by Gerard Manley Hopkins I can still say it it's one of those that's logged in my head and then I joined um, a theatre group called the Mask Theatre and did shows with them. And there was a place called Abington Park in Northampton. And there we used to do a show every, in fact, I've got some of it on video, cine film then, because my father was an RAF photographer. And uh, I've got cine film with me playing Hermia in A Midsummer Night's Dream when I was about 16, which is hysterical. Wow. Um, so, and, and then and I, did you I, know at that age that you wanted to do it professionally? Oh yeah, from yeah. the age of four, really. So throughout my childhood, all of that was all about theatre, and and I've got a play that I wrote when I was about seven or eight. I mean, just lots of it throughout, throughout, throughout. It was always what I was going to do. And was there any of that in your family? Was it sort of? Um, no. Was it just? No. no, my my mother was one of twelve, and they were very, they were very. Um, artistic family but no nobody the nearest I suppose is my cousin who went off to join a circus in Sicily and still is there she did a high wire act and um yeah my cousin Pippa when wow. they did this is your life she was the last person to come on um yeah so but no 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 other actors but I've got cousins who do wonderful artistic things. You know. And who were the sort of actors or artists that you sort of looked up to when you were growing up? Who were the well, sort of stars you were seeing in pantomimes? And I'm to be day? honest, I'm not really sure that there were any actors that I remember now that I loved then because it, it, I suppose in a way I was too young to even know that world. I just used to go along and see, um, I'm trying to think of who the wonderful man at the Theatre Royal was that I used to go and see. I can't remember his name. Um, but, but no, I just loved that whole world. And, and being in the Mars Theatre gave me a taste of what it was like to be on a stage. And we used to enter competitions and we used to do, you know, I did Midsummer Night's Dream and I did um, a play by uh, Christopher Fry called The Firstborn, playing a character called Tuzret, who sang. Um, and again, I still got some of the scripts and I still got, so complete memory lane, don't get rid of anything. Um, 
But I think the people who I used to love, well, once I'd left there and went to Lambda, um, and you know, the Ralph Richardsons and the Laurence Olivier's and, and, and those of the Derek Jacobies and, and those were the people that I sort of, because I, I loved um, serious theater. I never went into the theater to be a musical comedy person, which I, I somehow seem to have morphed into. Um, but I, it was very much Shakespeare and Chekhov and um, all that. And that's what I love. And, and I love poetry and I love doing readings and I love all the serious side of it as well. But I also love the fun side. And I think the fun side is what adapt, adopted me and took me over. Um, so I don't do so much of the serious stuff now. But I guess there's so many um, actors such as yourself and so many comedians as well that they their background is you know serious acting it, it seems to me that you can't really do the serious you can't really do the comedic stuff if you don't have an inherent understanding and instinct well i think i think for the, me the, the thing that, that the thing that gave me my comedy timing is the fact that i used to play in an orchestra i used to play percussion in an orchestra ronald harding's orchestra my brother used to play the violin and i used to play the percussion and um and I learned the piano. So it, it was that, playing in an orchestra and hearing rhythm all the time. And my father brought me up on classical music. That's what I listened to. So I was never really a, a pop and rock and roll girl. It was always classical music. And, and, and all of that gave me my sense of rhythm because it's very hard to teach somebody comic timing. You have to know when to ride the wave. And once you say something, you then have to wait till either the audience are just breaking, the wave is just breaking, and then you nip the next line in, or sometimes you have to leave it till it has broken and leave silence and then come in. And I think all of that, um, all my musical upbringing, um, as well as the poetry upbringing that I had, all sort of fed into that sense of um, understanding of where the comedy comes from. But that was my background. And I, I think sometimes you can get comedians who, just somehow naturally progress and, and are great serious actors without even realizing they can. I don't think you can actually quantify and say, well, that's, that's what you have to be to be that. But um, for me, uh, I still love serious drama. Um, and part of me, I'd love to do something at the National, something like that. Um, and I, I always envy people like Imelda Staunton who seem to be able to do all of it, you know, to do a, a sitcom and the national and a big musical and um but then i can't at the same time complain about my career because i think i've been very lucky and had a lot of wonderful parts so it's it's very difficult sometimes to guide your career as well because things take over and guide you in a certain way and suddenly you're there when you thought you'd be there and you know it's a strange thing to be able to control yeah, and you've you've um, played so many phenomenal characters. Everybody, you know, Dorian Green in Birds of a Feather, Miss Hannigan, uh, Moliere plays at Chichester. Mm. What other roles do you sort of yearn to play? What well, I'd love to go back into Chekhov in a way. Um, I'd love to do some of the great Chekhov roles, but I, they don't seem to be so done so far. But I have to say that the last five or six years have been amazing. I mean, um, I sort of say, you know, Young Frankenstein was a wonderful thing for me to do because I had a chance to work with Mel Brooks, who I absolutely adored. And um, it was scary. And, uh, you know, I, it was like, oh my goodness, because I'd had heard if you didn't like you, sometimes you were out. But he was glorious. So I, I, he, he was over, over a period of about three months. So that was a great highlight in my career. And getting something like Birds of a Feather, where you had the lead roles are played by three women, was fairly unheard of in 1989 when we did, I think the Liber Birds, Polly James, and I can't remember the other one. Um, the, the, Li the Liber Birds were sort of first, and then three women who were the leads in a sitcom, and that sitcom has lasted for 30 years, is fairly unheard of. Um, I mean, we did 15 years, then we had a 10 year break, then we came back. No, we did 10 years, 10 years, they come back. But during that 10 years, it was always on. And we've done something like 150 episodes. Um, and and I do you remember, remember getting the script for the first oh, time? Yeah. Well, do you what remember happened, what you're still... I was doing a play written by two friends, Gary Lyons and Stuart Perman, which we did at a place called the Good Luck Theatre in Covent Garden. And we did it for no money. And it was a lunchtime piece. It was called Exclusive Yarns. And it was about, um, I played a character called Pippa Goldflat with hair out to here who ran a wool shop in Primrose Hill that spoke about it like Joan Collins would discuss oil. And everything was very like Dorian Green and rather exaggerated, and rather glorious and very funny. 
and it became a cult and they transferred it to the comedy theater in the West End. And I remember inviting Maurice Brown and Lawrence Marks, who I'd done a sitcom for that didn't really work called Roots um, some years before. And I thought maybe not for me, but I thought they could use the writers because I thought they'd be brilliant sitcom writers because they'd written this really funny piece. And um, Maurice came, oh no, Lawrence came. Maurice didn't come, Lawrence came with his wife, Brigitte. And I remember Anne Charleston, who played Madge in Neighbours, was in my dressing room for some reason. I didn't know her, but she'd come backstage to say hello. We were having a glass of champagne. And Bridget, um, Lawrence's wife, adored Neighbours. So it's one of those rather strange meetings. And Lawrence said to me then, would you be interested in doing a sitcom? And I said, well, send me the script and I'll, I'll see. And I remember afterwards he said, we didn't think you'd accept it because we thought of you as a sort of serious actress. I mean, it was a moment there saying that. So they sent me the script and within two seconds I'd rung and said yes. And then Pauline Linda and I had a meeting. Remember we went to the Ritz and um, always remember because we had champagne and I remember Pauline and Linda put some sparkling water into the champagne. And um, we sat there and I, I thought, oh my God, they've known each other since they were eight. And this is going to be really weird to sort of come in for this such a tight group um, but it worked and from that time onwards it was like family and I remember the first episode um, I was having an Ann Summers party and um, I remember my father was there god bless him he died many years ago and I remember he said to Lawrence and Morris do you think this is going to work and I remember Morris saying they'll still be here in 10 years and I remember thinking oh, come on, 10 years. And of course, 30 years later, it's still very successful. And um, I remember on that first episode, I think, I think it was Pauline's character who said something like bloody or there was something, there was something that she said, which was like a swear word, but not really a swear word. And there was something like 300 complaints that a woman had sworn on television. And I think that is what led most people to go, oh my God, maybe we should switch into this. And the, I mean, we used to get 20 million viewers at one point. It was, it was absolutely huge. And that of course meant that then you knew who I was, which meant then that I could get interesting jobs to do. And, and um, I, I've never really done reality, although I have done a few things, but I think, when I was doing Young Frankenstein, I had an email through from my agent saying, what do you think about this? Uh, would you like to go on a pilgrimage to Rome with a number of other people? And you'd have to walk. And it was a long, complicated thing, but it was all about walking to Rome. And after a lot of negotiations this way and that way, I finally did it. And I did it two years ago. And we ended up having half an hour with the Pope. And it became one of the most significant things I've ever done in my career, let alone my life, probably. It was one of those things which I thought, I, I, this could never be, to have half an hour with the Pope. And I blessed him and I made him laugh. And um, I, I, it was just extraordinary. I, I, I really, I, I made him laugh twice. And it was, it was just an extraordinary experience. And I thought, mm -hmm. all that has come out of this career. And this career which, started when I was seven in Northampton on the new theatre um, and it's just one of those glorious things about the business I work in that you never know when the phone will ring and something wonderful will be around the corner. Yeah I think that's exactly it. I mean hearing you talk about the Pope there you just don't there's a wonderful joy about what we do is you're never quite sure where no. you're sort of going to be heading and as long as you're open and you allow yourself the world to sort of you know yeah. happen and that you're experiencing then you have these incredible experiences I mean that's absolutely yeah. mind-blowing that you I remember you sent me the Christmas card you know, a couple know. Of years ago with you meeting the Pope and it was just like my goodness it's just but I think also what, what was so exciting about that was the fact that um, we started in the Swiss Alps and a thousand kilometers later we were in Rome. I'd never been to Rome. And the idea of walking on the old pilgrim route to Rome, to me, was one of the most exciting. I mean, I cried for two days at night thinking about it because it, to me it was so exciting and unusual. And um, when we actually did it, it was a group of people who were still absolutely like this. And um, 
su the support from people like Brendan Cole and Greg Rutherford, who would wait and help those of us that couldn't walk too fast. And, and I actually could find I could stride out. And uh, one day, I think we walked something like 15 miles, you know, and I had my sticks and I was uh, chomping along. And, and then we got to Rome and I looked and there was this blessed city and it was like oh, and then going to the Vatican and then going backstage in the Vatican to get what they call our um, testimonials and we were given to them in the sacristy at the Vatican where people don't go and and we all sat there and we were blessed and given these testimonials that's now of course in a frame in my house um, as something that I thought I I was over 70 and I, I pitted myself against myself to do it and I did it, and uh, it was one of the most exciting, challenging things I've ever done, but wow. absolutely glorious. And, and, you know, yes, that's reality television, but my goodness, I wouldn't change that for the world. It was just amazing. Yeah, well, I mean, that's one of the great things about reality TV, isn't it? Again, it's about sort of new experiences and showing us all a sort of yeah. aspect of life or an experience that we maybe wouldn't come into contact with otherwise. I think it's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. And you've straddled so many different aspects in your career, you know, everything from, as you say, you know, plays in Chichester, major musicals, um, television, reality shows. Yeah. How do you find moving between all of those things? I, I find mean, it very easy because... I only take a job if it excites me. And, um, you know, I mean, Annie, as you know, I've done many times, and that's a glorious, absolutely legendary musical. And the part of Hannigan is an iconic part. Um, and um, I always love to play that part for real and not like a comedy, you know, cardboard cutout. She's absolutely for real and she's sad and she's desperate and she's, she is what she is. And, uh, um, and, and that is always very exciting to do that musical. Um, and then, as I say, the walk to Rome, that's reality, but who could say no to that? Who would even mm -hmm. think about saying no to that? Um, Strictly Come Dancing, that again was something I did when I was 71. Again, pitting myself against myself and actually having a wonderful time. And the glorious thing about that was going to the O2 and doing dancing to 15,000 people. When would you ever, I'd never do that, yeah. never in a million years. Um, and then doing a radio play, doing you know, and and doing that, and then doing a sitcom on television, and and um, but what you do is you play what that part asks for, you play what that part demands. You you're in the hands of the director, you're in the hands of everybody else. You you know, theatre's a team, um, and and you just immerse yourself in it, and 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 you know, I always try to make sure everybody gets on and and everybody enjoys the whole experience um and especially now what you're finding now is the sense of community that is coming out from everybody and the sense of the community that the theatrical mm. community have um both to help others you know and and to keep their spirits up as well is extraordinary um and i think that's always been there in the theater business i think um some people like to think oh people don't get on or they're stabbing people in the back and treading over people i've never found that I've never found that. I've always found it a community that helps, that suckers, that, that um, you know, gives help to people and uh, an amazing um, a, a community. Because also, I think when you're doing a piece, when I perform in front of somebody like yourself, you, you lay yourself open and, and I have to expect words from you. You might say, no, I don't like what you're doing. Let's go down a different route. And sometimes it's hard that, you know, you... You open yourself and, and also it's like when you go to the critics you know the critics might not like you they might not like you in that thing and i think that's something i've realized is not everybody is going to like everything that i do i yeah. I, I will never please anybody as i think now social media has shown us and if you don't like me that's fine if you don't like what i do that also is fine i can only do what i can do i'm in your hands as a director so i will go down that path if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That, that, that's the chance you take. And also, you can't let that destroy you. So, you know, you just have to do the best you can. Yeah, I think that's, um, it's so wise. I mean, it's, it's, it's so challenging nowadays, isn't it? There's mm. so much sort of social media and, you know, the people are getting sort of instant responses, whether it's... But I don't look at social media. I don't, I don't tweet, I don't Instagram, I don't do all that. And I don't read reviews. I think I, I understand if the reaction you're getting from the audience is such 
that it seems like you're on the right path, then that's the most important thing. And then you will get a director or the associate director if you're on the road or in town or whatever, who will come in and say, okay, let's pull it back a bit or you can go further in that or you get notes and then you can duck and dive around and, and you know, alter it slightly. Yeah, it's amazing just talking to you again, Leslie. I'm just reminded, you know, from those days we were rehearsing Annie together, your energy is just absolutely exhilarating and sort of oh. mind-blowing, really. And I think there'll be many sort of youngsters watching our chat thinking, my goodness, this is a woman in her 70s and I haven't got half of that energy. Do you ever see yourself sort of slowing down or taking things easy? Well, I, mean, I think I, eventually my body will say stop. <clears throat> I think one thing the lockdown has done is forced me to stop. <clears throat> um, and I think, um, but I, I try to structure the day like any other day. Um, but yeah, eventually, I'm sure it will. But then there are many wonderful actors who are still going in their eighties, if not their nineties. You don't, you don't have to be doing it all the time. You don't have to do it every day. You don't have to accept every job. You know, you can just keep things ticking over if you want to. And if you don't want to anymore, and you think now's the time for me just to back away but I think working in the business keeps your mind alert mm -hmm. learning lines is what keeps your mind alert it keeps all the everything ticking over and I think that's quite important and the other thing I think is quite important is exercise I think exercise is absolutely vital to you know growing old disgracefully if you like <laughs> <laughs> and um obviously we were all disappointed that sister acts being postponed oh, do you know what I mean, I rehearsed with Jay Alexander, our wonderful MD, and here within these walls, I, I, I mean, <clears throat> I got absolutely, I would cry again. I cry very easily at the moment. But, you know, just singing that song and thinking, oh my goodness, it was so strange having seen the Pope, met the Pope, and then I'm going into a nun's, and that's next year's Christmas card, is my nun. <laughs> and um, I was so looking forward to that because not only was it a wonderful cast, it's actually a wonderful piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, the music in it is beyond. And I was so, and I'm hoping we can pick that up in the not too distant future and fly with it again because it, it's one of those pieces which I think is absolutely glorious. Everybody remembers the film or, or when they've seen it on say, I know Craig and Rebel Horwood did a wonderful version of it before. And it's a glorious piece. And I think a piece that probably we could do with seeing now. Um, and, you know, I, I think theater is one of those things. It's very interesting. When you're under lockdown, what do you do? You watch people singing, you watch television, you listen to music, you listen to plays on Radio 4, you read a book. Um, it's the creative arts that you turn to. If life was literally about getting from beginning to end with nothing else happening in your life, no creativity, there would be no joy. And I think when we do come out of this, I think people are going to need more and more that sense that they get from theater of seeing other people's lives and, and just losing themselves in something glorious. Because I really, really do believe there's nothing quite so wonderful as live theater. I've seen things on stage. I remember, oh, seeing Royal Hunt of the Sun um, with um, Robert Stevens in it. And I remember, you know, seeing Paul Schofield do King Lear and it was like, it stabs you in the stomach. You go, oh, that acting is just, Glorious. I remember seeing Arturo Ui with Keith Baxter, who's a glorious actor, doing a scene where he was playing a drunk actor. And I always say to him, whenever I see him, if somebody said you can take one scene from everything you've seen in 50 years, it would be that scene because it was so gloriously played. And I've gone off piece completely now. No, I know. Well, but, but I think there is something in theatre which is so wonderful. And, and, and I, you see, I love pantomime. And I think I love her and I take it quite seriously. I don't take it as a joke. It is, it's telling a fairy tale and it's telling it with wonderful lights, wonderful music, you know, sets, costumes, magic, magic can turn on a sixpence and uh, you can make people laugh and then you can pull them in and you can scare them. And it could be kids only time in a theater and you want them to love it because you want them to keep coming back. Yeah. I think it is going to take a while to get people back in theater because you know, to be sitting still with a lot of people is going to take a lot of courage to get back into that. But I think once we do come through this, I think people are going to need, and people are going to be incredibly moved 
by what they see on stage and also what they see on film or what they see on television because it's obviously going to resonate with a lot of you know what's going on now is going to filter through to what comes next but i also think that what comes next should also be away from this so people can remember what they loved before this and enjoy what's glorious about musicals and comedy and just being able to go and leave their problems at the door and have a good time. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And you talk so passionately and so eloquently earlier about the sense of community within a theatre mm. as looking out for each other and that sense of mm. camaraderie and, you know, it being mm. a family unit. And I think that extends to the audience, doesn't it? They're part of the well, community, it's, it's, they're part of the ecology. See. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting because when you actually do a play, especially when you tour, wherever you go is different and you may go, I don't know, Newcastle and then you go to Sheffield and then we come to Leicester or wherever. Everything is different. Every audience is different. Every audience takes a sort of corporate identity and you can never, sometimes you say, God, they were quiet tonight. And then you get to the end and they're all on their feet. I mean, it, it, it's very difficult to read an audience. You can read how to play things to them, but it, it, they take a sort of identity of their own and they become, you, you do it that evening for those people. And that evening can never be repeated because that's a unique experience. And that's why it's so fascinating. You can go to see something three times and every time you're seeing a different thing, you're seeing a different piece and the audience is seeing a different play. It's yeah, it is. It is fascinating. It's always amazing as a director, especially when something's on tour or even if it's just mm. sitting down for a run at Curve and, you know, you leave after press night and let it settle down for a couple of weeks and then you go out and see something in another touring venue or just come back into Curve or wherever it is and catch up with it. And the the journey the actors you guys go on and the, yeah. the new depths and the detail and the way you learn from an audience it's absolutely fascinating know, it never it ceases to be exhilarating it is. and also learning. you learn how you're working with somebody it's like um some days you know you'll get a, a laugh on this particular thing and other days you don't get a laugh on that so you have to duck and dive and pull in another line tighter around it you you play the audience for that night but everything doesn't land always because sometimes somebody could cough you could deliver a line and <coughs> and therefore they don't hear that line. So it falls flat. So then you have to speed up around the next one. That's why it's so fascinating. You never stop learning. Yeah. And what, um, what advice, I mean, you've, 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 you've given us so much during this chat already, but what advice would you give to a, an actor starting out today? What would be your What I of... would say is, don't go into the business if you're not absolutely certain it's what you want to do. Um, you've got to love acting to want to do it. It's a hard graph. Learn what you're doing go to drama school if you can but if you can't then that's fine get into the business go and do work experience go see as much theater as you can as you can afford um learn from what you see on the stage and also i think it's really important to learn who all the greats are learn who people are in the theater learn how we get there. i think at drama school you should learn the history of theater go as many times as you can to theater learn about you know why are the olivier awards called the olivier awards who are they based on learn about laurence olivier learn from watching those people and then do as many parts as you can if you get offered something do it if it's something that you want to do and and would enjoy to do do it it might not be the biggest part or the best part in the world but learn from it and um keep doing it because the more you work with people the more people you get to know the more people will use you in the future and they might give you that big break that you need just keep working and be kind to people really you know go and be a good company member being a good company member is one of the most important things in the world because if you have three people that are all equally talented and any one of them you think could do it it's the person that you know will fit into that slot who will welcome everybody who will be good to work with who won't be tricksy who won't be difficult who won't be nasty whose ego isn't too big so you know and just keep working work at it and love it and I would also say probably have a backup as well so that if you're not working, you know you can go work front of house or you know you can go and work in wardrobe. Um, but if you love it and you want to do it, it's an amazing business to be in.
Yeah, well, Leslie, it's just been extraordinary talking to you. Your wisdom and your passion is absolutely intoxicating and it's oh. just so refreshing and inspiring in these times. So thank you so much. It's my absolute pleasure. It's so inspiring, Leslie. Thank you.